Today we're going to look at a very classic number theory result and this ties together two ideas that don't really seem like they should be related but they are. Which is maybe a very specific example of something that happens in mathematics all the time. That is, connections that don't seem apparent. Okay, so what are we going to do today? Well, we're going to look at perfect numbers and how they are related to Mersenne primes. But before we do that, let's recall the required definitions. So we'll say that a natural number n is a perfect number if it's the sum of its proper divisors. Okay, well, let's look at some small examples of perfect numbers. So 6 is perfect because it's equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3, and those are all of the proper divisors of 6. I guess I should say that when I say proper divisors, I mean all of the divisors that are not equal to the number itself. Of course, you could tweak your definition to include the divisors, including the number, but we'll just leave it as is. Okay, and then, well, the next one is 28, which is 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 14. And then, well, you could look for some more or look up some more if you'd like to, but after the result that we see today, you'll be able to generate them quite quickly. So next up, Mersenne primes are primes of the form 2 to the p minus 1, where p is prime. Well, it turns out in order for this 2 to the p minus 1 to be prime, well, the p has to be prime. That's actually pretty easy to show because you can factor this thing right here if you had a composite number in the exponent. So let's look at some examples of Mersenne primes. So 3 is an example, that's 2 squared minus 1. 7 is an example, that's 2 cubed minus 1. 31 is the next example, that's 2 to the 5th minus 1. After that, you get 127, which is 2 to the 7 minus 1. But you don't always get a prime number when you insert a prime into an object like this. Observe that 2 to the 11 minus 1 factors as 23 times 89. Okay, so now for our big classic result of the day, and that is all even perfect numbers are of the form 2 to the p minus 1 times 2 to the p minus 1. I think there's some nice symmetry built into that formula. Oh, and I guess I should say here that 2 to the p minus 1 is a Mersenne prime. And although I haven't written it exactly like this, this actually puts a nice one-to-one -one correspondence between Mersenne primes and even perfect numbers. And you might say, well, what about odd perfect numbers? Well, it's unknown if there are odd perfect numbers. So that's pretty interesting because perfect numbers have this fairly simple definition, yet we haven't found any odd ones, and we haven't proven that there aren't odd ones. And then you might also ask, are there infinitely many perfect numbers? Well, that's also unknown. And, well, equivalently, it's unknown if there are infinitely many Mersenne primes. Okay, so let's do step one of this proof, which is to show that every number that's of the form 2 to the p minus 1 times 2 to the p minus 1 is perfect. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, the thing that we're going to do is to list the divisors of, well, that number right there. But given the fact that this bit that I'm underlining in purple is prime, finding the divisors are fairly straightforward. Notice you have divisors attached to the powers of 2 and nothing else. And then you have divisors attached to the power of 2 and that prime. Okay, so let's make a list. So 1 is definitely a divisor. 2 is definitely a divisor, 2 squared is definitely a divisor, 2 cubed, and then all the way up to 2 to the p minus 1. So those are all of our divisors that do not divide that prime number 2 to the p minus 1. Now we need to write down all of the divisors that do divide that. So we'll have 2 to the p minus 1 itself. We'll have 2 times 2 to the p minus 1 we'll have 2 squared times 2 to the p minus 1, 
all the way up to, well, the last one that's not equal to the number, which will be two to the p minus two times two to the p minus one. Observe if we put one more power of two in there, well, we would get the number that we started with, but we don't want that because it's the sum of the proper divisors. So I guess I should maybe put here that we're looking at the proper divisors. Okay, so now let's take sums of each of these lists. So let's say this is taking the sum of that first list, but observe that we have a geometric series. Well, it's a finite geometric series. The common ratio is two. So this has a well-known sum of two to the p minus one. It's actually two to the p minus one over two minus one, but two minus one is clearly equal to one. And then, well, what about this other one? So we'll also find the sum of this. But observe that that's also a finite geometric series. In this case, we have one fewer terms, and we also have a starting term of two to the p minus one. So this is two to the p minus one times two to the p minus one minus one. So we've got something that looks like that. But now all that's left for this step is to add these two together and see what we get. But observe when adding these two together, we can factor this two to the p minus one out, and we'll be left with a one from this first term. And from the second term, we'll have a uh, two to the p minus one, and then minus one. Okay, but now, well, we get some nice simplification here. This one and this one cancels, and we're left with two to the p minus one times two to the p minus one. But that's the original number that we started with up here, meaning that that number is indeed perfect. Okay, so now let's do the reverse of the claim. In other words, or the reverse of step one. In other words, we'll start with a perfect number and show that it must be of this form. Okay, so now let's start with an even perfect number and then, well, construct this two to the p minus one times two to the p minus one, you know, structure for it. So I'm actually gonna introduce a little bit of uh, notation here. So, and that's gonna be something called the sum divisor function. So here, let's just put that here. So we're gonna define this thing, which is sigma of n to be the sum of all divisors of n. So not just the proper divisors, but all divisors. And I should point out here that notice that sigma of n in this case is equal to two times n. And that's because our n was a perfect number. And I guess I should say that since we're defining this and we've already fixed n as a perfect number, I should maybe call this k. And then we've got that fact over there that sigma of n is equal to k. Okay. So the next thing that we want to do is write in in the following way. So we're going to write this as 2 to the m times q, where m is bigger than or equal to 1 and q is odd. So in other words, we're factoring all of the evenness out of n. So we know that we can take m to be bigger than or equal to 1, expressly because we, did, we already assumed that n was an even number. And now here comes like a little subclaim, which is like extremely important for this argument. And that is that q is in fact a prime number. So we'll first start with q as a prime number. And then after we know that q is a prime number or maybe kind of along the way, we'll see that q has the right form. Okay, so let's notice the following. So we have two times n is equal to sigma of n, but then that's also gonna be equal to sigma of two to the m times sigma of q. And you might say, oh, well, where did that come from? 
Well, that's because this sigma function is multiplicative. So I'll just recall that right here. We're not gonna prove that. And so if the GCD of A and B is one, so I'll just write that as A and B in parentheses is one. Sometimes you leave off the GCD there, that's standard notation. Then we have sigma of AB is equal to sigma of A, sigma of B. So this is an example of one of those multiplicative number theoretic functions. Okay, but it's actually pretty straightforward to find the sum of the divisors of two to the m. You know, and this can be done in parallel to what we did on the last board when we did step one of this exploration. And that's gonna give you two to the m plus one minus one because you're just adding up a bunch of multiples of two. And then here you'll have sigma of q. Okay, great. But then notice that this is also equal to two to the n, but then, because that's where we started this whole thing, but then since n is two to the m times q, we know that that's gonna be two to the m plus one times q. Okay, great. But next up, let's observe that two to the m plus one and two to the m plus one minus one are relatively prime. Well, that's because this is a power of two and this is an odd number. And of course, powers of two and odd numbers don't have any common divisors. I think that's pretty clear. But what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that Q must be divisible by two to the M plus one. And that's because this two to the M plus one minus one divides the right-hand side, so it divides the left-hand side. It can't divide this portion of the left-hand side, and it's relatively prime to this portion, so it must divide Q. But dividing Q means we can write Q as two to the M plus one minus one times some number which I'll call A for you know some choice of A. But now what we'll do is take this expression that we've just determined for Q and we'll reinsert it here and look at the extreme left and right hand side of well, the equation that we have. So now we have two to the M plus one times two to the M plus one minus one times this number A is now equal to two to the m plus one minus one times sigma of q. Okay, great. But from here we can cancel this two to the m plus one minus one from both sides of this equation. So let's just cancel it right there. We won't rewrite it, we'll just have it canceled. So now that's gone. But now let's observe that we have some divisors of q. So this is the sum of all of the divisors of Q, but we know that Q divides Q and A also divides Q. So this is equal to A plus Q plus what I'll call the rest of the divisors. Okay, but now I can just drop the rest of those advisors and or divisors and I'll pick up an inequality. So this is gonna be bigger than or equal to A plus Q. Q. Oh, but look what we can do from this. So now we've got this expression over here for Q that we can plug into this A plus Q. And well, some stuff cancels and we get something nice. We get that this is two to the M plus one times A. But if we look at the extreme left and right hand side of this new equation, we'll see that the extreme left and right hand side are the same. So that means that this inequality that we've built is actually an equality. In other words, we have sigma of Q is equal to A plus Q. So in other words, the sum of the divisors of Q is A plus Q, but A is also a divisor. But that means that A has to be equal to one. Otherwise we would have more divisors there. So here we have, that means that A is equal to one. But then looping that back in one more time, we have sigma of Q is equal to Q plus one, but the only numbers that have that property are primes. 
So in other words, here we have Q is equal to some prime number. In other words, Q is a prime. Now, putting that back over here with the fact that we determined that A was equal to one, we have Q is equal to this two to the M plus one minus one. In other words, Q is equal to two to the P minus one, where P is prime where we have this translation that m plus 1 is equal to p. Okay, but then throwing that all the way back up here, we have our final result, which is that n is equal to 2 to the m, but observe that we just saw that m plus 1 was p, so that means that m is p minus 1, so that's 2 to the p minus 1 times q, but we just determined that q was 2 to the p minus one, but that's exactly the format of n that we were going for. And that's a good place to stop.